and welcome to your Unit 1 review for Algebra 2R. I'm going to scroll through this review packet so you see which problems I've highlighted, and those are the ones I plan to go over. All right, so I tried to pick a variety. I'm obviously not going to do all of the problems in the packet. Otherwise, I'd probably be doing this for like two hours thoroughly explaining everything. But I tried to pick a variety. So starting right at the beginning with question two for exponent rules. First thing I am noticing is that I have some x's in the bottom that can be combined. Anytime I'm multiplying numbers with the same base, I can add the exponents. So 4 plus a negative 7 is a negative 3. And then from there, I personally like to move things. Negative exponents are like elevators, and they just move things up or down. So I can move this y to the negative fifth to the other side of the fraction bar. And likewise, I can do the same thing with x to the negative 3. And by doing so, it will change the exponent to be positive. So technically, the only thing in the denominator now is 1, because everything moved up. When you're multiplying numbers with the same base, again, you add the exponents. And we get x cubed, y 12. And that's your correct answer. Now for question 3, it's actually very simple, but a lot of students forget how to do this. This is from day 7 in our notes, our factor and remainder theorem. Given the graph of p of x at the right, what is the remainder when p of x is divided by x minus 1? What factor and remainder, remainder theorem says is we can plug in the root or solution of what we're dividing by into the original function as the dividend, and it will always spit out the remainder. So if I take x minus 1 and set it equal to 0 to solve, I would get x equals 1, right? So that's the root of the divisor. Now you're going to take the dividend, or your a function that's being divided, and evaluate it at that number. So I go to my graph, because I obviously don't have a function here to plug it into. I go to x equals 1. Looks like my y value comes out at negative 4. And that represents your remainder. And that's factor and remainder theorem. Now, just for fun here, let's say hypothetically I wanted you to divide p of x by x minus 2. That means you can evaluate the function at p of 2, because that's the root of x minus 2. Go to your graph, and it looks like we come out at 0. If that represents the remainder, that means x minus 2 divides evenly into p of x. So therefore, x minus 2 must be a factor of p of x. So I know that was kind of going a little off book there, but that's also a type of question that we've asked in the context of that picture. Kind of leads me into the next question, because still factor and remainder theorem, which binomial is a factor of the following function? So just for sake of making it easy to talk about, let's call that our function f of x. Rather than going through and dividing by each of these binomials, factor and remainder theorem says I can evaluate it at the root of the divisor, the root of the thing you're dividing by. And if we get a 0, because the remainder would be what comes out, then it must be a factor. So if I grab my calculator, it's taking a second to load here. There we go. If I take my calculator, I can take 2 and store him as x. This is a nice little calculator hack. OK? What I do here. And now I'm going to type in this expression, x to the fourth minus 4x squared minus 4x plus 8. Enter. I get 0. 
So that worked right off of that. Now, just for sake of argument, let's try number two for letter B. So if I store negative two as X, and I do the exact same thing, okay, I'm plugging into the expression X to the fourth minus 4X squared minus 4X plus eight. And I evaluate it at negative two, which is what I'm telling my calculator to do, I get 16. And like I said, I mean, we got this to work right away because this is the remainder. This is actually your answer for factor. But this one means the remainder is 16, and that's why that one's out. I could continue doing it for 4 and negative 4, which I'll just show you real quick. 4 store is x. Go up and you can copy-paste that. Okay, this ends up being 184, so that's obviously out. And then negative 4 store is x. Okay, 216. So again, those are your remainders. This is the only one with a remainder of zero, which is why option A is your correct answer. So I figured it was worth going through and showing all the options because your correct answer may not always be the first one that you try. All right, moving on to the next page. All right, profit problems. A profit function p of x for a company and the cost function c of x is subtracted from the revenue function r of x. The profit function for the Hershey company is given as follows, some quadratic, and the revenue function is given as follows. The cost function is what? All right, first of all, this statement right here is actually giving you the equation that we have in our notes. Profit is equal to... And it says the cost function subtracted from the revenue. So R of X minus C of X. Revenue minus cost, which you may or may not remember from your notes on day one or day two of our note packet. I think it's day two. In this problem, they're giving you what P of X is and what R of X is. They want you to solve for C of X. So you know what I'm going to do, and this I actually got this idea from Mrs. Marin. I can't take credit. I've done it in a little bit of a harder way. I'm going to rearrange this expression to have it already solved for cost before I even substitute in. So what I mean by that is if I subtract over, excuse me, add over C of X to the other side of the equation. It's always so awkward writing C of X because I mess up the parentheses. There we go. I would have P of X plus C of X equals R of X. Now remember, you want to solve for cost, so wouldn't you want to subtract your profit function? So by doing this, I've learned that our cost function is equal to revenue minus profit. So by doing that, that just makes my life a little bit easier for solving for C of X. Otherwise, I'd have to subtract from over here and then divide by negative 1. And that's just a little bit nasty. All right, so I'm going to write in my R of X function. And then write in my P of X function. Now this is where students tend to mess up because they don't write parentheses. You're subtracting all of P of X, so you need to make sure you have parentheses around that entire expression. Now from there, you could take another line in your work and distribute the negative, which is most of the time what I do, or go through and say, well, if I am going to subtract this, it's technically the same thing as adding the opposite. So you could change this to a plus sign then that would be plus, this would be minus, and that would be plus, okay? If you don't like that, though, it's literally just the same thing here, except for all these signs now change to the exact opposite. So it's that plus 150x plus 0.05x squared plus 250x plus 300 because you were subtracting a negative. Now from there, you're just combining your like terms. So it looks like we've got x squared right there, x is right there, and then a positive 300. 
So based on just looking at my multiple choice answers, I actually already know I'm going to eliminate B and D because they had a negative 300. Then from there, look at how we have a negative 0.3x squared plus 0.5, so that would be a positive 0.2, so that's the same. 150 plus 250, though, would give me... Oops, hold on a second. I just realized this is supposed to be a negative. Oops. There we go. I copied that wrong. Negative. All right, so 150x minus the 250x would give me negative 100, which is why it's choice A. So you just got to be careful with your signs there. <laughs> All right. Moving on to exponent rules. All right, so for number eight, anytime you have a product or a quotient raised to an exponent, an outside power, just zoom in for a second there, that outside exponent applies to everything on the inside. Sometimes students will just write this. And that's incorrect, okay? They're multiplying the exponents, which is good, but they're forgetting that it's technically three to the fifth as well. So make sure you don't forget that it's a three to the fifth on that outside exponent. Now from there, three to the fifth is 243, which you would just use your calculator to figure that out. So 243 x to the 20th divided by y to the 30th, and that's your final answer. Okay, moving on to number 10. So something you could do again is distribute that outside exponent to everybody. So this is 4 to the negative 2 x to the negative 8, and now y to the positive 6. Now remember, negative exponents are just like elevators. They move things up or down. So I'm going to take this 4 to the negative 2 and move him to the other side of the fraction bar. Likewise, I'm going to do the same thing with the x. y to the 6 is still in the numerator, but now I have a 4 to the positive 2 over x to the positive 8. We all should know that 4 squared is 16. And that's your final answer. All right, moving over to question 12. First thing I'm noticing with this parenthesis is that I have things I can combine or simplify. I see x's and I see y's. Now remember, when you are dividing numbers with the same base, you can subtract the exponents. So 4 minus a negative 2 would be a positive 6. And then negative 7 minus 4 would be a negative 11 all raised to the second power. So again, I'm doing denominator subtracted from numerator to do that. All right, from there, let's distribute that outside exponent of 2. So that's x to the 12th, y to the negative 22, Negative exponents are like elevators. They move things up or down. So I can take this y to the negative 22 and move it to the other side of the fraction bar, but then it will be positive. So I have x to the positive 12 divided by y to the positive 22, and that's your final answer. All right, now question 13, just taking in the problem, you have this monomial times this monomial. It's just a giant multiplication problem. So let's start with the coefficients. You have 1 tenth times 5 tenths. 1 times 5, or 5 halves, excuse me. You have 1 times 5, which is 5, and 10 times 2, which is 20. Great. So that's multiplying fractions. Now it works with the x's and the y's. When you're multiplying numbers with the same base, we add the exponents. So this would be times also x to the positive 5, just adding 8 and negative 3, y to the negative 3. All right, cleaning this up a little bit, and if you want to put that over 1, this is actually the same thing as 
5 x to the 5th y to the negative 3 all over 20, just to make it look like one fraction. Then from there, I know that I can divide that by 5, and I can divide that by 5. So 5 over 20 reduces to 1 fourth. And I also know that I can move the y to the negative 3 to the other side of the fraction bar and make them positive. So in the numerator, I have 1x to the 5th. In the bottom, remember, you had the 4 from the reducing. And then I'm going to move the y to the bottom and make it a positive 3. So x to the 5th over 4y to the 3rd. And that's your final answer. All right, and that's the problems I wanted to do on that page. All right, moving on to the next page. All right, question 17. You have a trinomial times a binomial. You could, if you wanted, set up a 3 by 2 grid. like so, and try to kind of treat it like a Punnett square in biology, or do what I like to call each with each other, and multiply each of these by the binomial. So starting with the n squared, if I multiply n squared by 2n minus 4, that would be 2n cubed minus 4n squared. Okay, now I'll move on to the 6n. That would be 12n squared minus 24n. Lastly, multiply by the negative 4. Minus 8n plus 16. Now, the way I organized my work was actually on purpose so that I was lining up all my like terms. You don't have to do that. You could just do it in one straight line. But by doing that as I went, it actually kind of saved me a little bit of effort there. So here's my n squareds. So this is 2n cubed plus 8n squared minus 32n plus 16. And that would be your final answer. Now, if you were to do the tabular method and put the n squared plus 6n minus 4 at the top and the 2n minus 4 along the right, you would actually find that a lot of these same numbers would end up repeating in the grid. And then you'd add along the diagonals. So I'm not going to do that. If you want to go ahead and do that, remember that you were just multiplying across here, like n squared times 2n is 2n cubed. Okay, look at that. That already matches, and so on and so forth. All right, moving on to question 19. Okay, double parentheses, and I'm noticing a lot of negatives. And then on top of that, everything's going to get squared. So first thing I'm going to do is clean up the innermost set of parentheses. So this is 5a minus 3a plus 6 minus 3. Now before I take care of that outside exponent of 2, let's combine like terms on the inside. I have 5a minus 3a, which is a 2a. 6 minus 3 is a 3 squared. Now a lot of students will try to distribute that outside exponent inside, but remember you can't do that if there's an addition or a subtraction sign. So I always like to say, when in doubt, write it out. Now, I changed this to soft parentheses versus hard parentheses. It technically doesn't matter at this point. The only reason they did hard brackets versus soft was to help you differentiate who went with what. All right, so from there, now I am foiling. Okay, so 2a times 2a is 4a squared. My outer terms give me a 6a. My inner terms give me a 6a, and my last terms give me a 9. Put it all together. Final answer is 4a squared plus 12a plus 9. Final answer. All right, what else did I pick on this page? Question 20. All right, so it looks like I have two things being multiplied together plus another two things being multiplied together. In each of these cases, I'm going to do my first outer, inner, last, and FOIL. All right, 
right, so 7x and 2x is 14x squared. Then I get a 21x, 12x, 18, which is 14x squared plus 33, right? 33x plus 18. Okay, let me actually color code this. Plus, now we got to FOIL this. 10x squared minus 45x minus 4x plus 18. Combine these. So minus 49x plus 18. And then from there, you're combining your like terms. So x squareds with x squareds would give me a 24x squared. 33x minus 49x would give me a minus 16x. And then 18 plus 18 gives me a 36. So 24x squared minus 16x plus 36, that's your final answer. All right, number 22 I want to do next, cube roots. So now this is a different perspective than square roots. So actually quickly, I'm going to look at 21 real quick. 21, like if you wanted to simplify the radical 45, you would break that up into biggest perfect squares, right? 9 and 5, and then that would be negative 2 times 3 times 5, which that all reduces to negative 6 radical 5, just at least that first portion. It's a different perspective when I'm doing cube roots. You're not looking for biggest perfect square, it's biggest perfect cube. Now, in something like number three, I'm actually noticing that I have only a negative one I can pull out. That's actually a biggest perfect cube. You can't take the cube root of three, so I just split that apart. Plus two times. Now, the biggest perfect cube is 27 in 162 because 3 cubed is 27, but 27 times 6 would give me 162. Now, I obviously already know my answers ahead of time, but the reason that you can do that or figure that out, do 162 divided by x in your y equals, look at your table of values, and look for perfect cubes. I know a perfect cube is 27 because it's 3 cubed, 27 times 6. Lastly, 81. 81 is 27 times 3. Okay, look at all the work I'm showing. I'm being very diligent here. Okay, so I know this is going to simplify to negative 3 times a negative 1, cube root of 3, plus 2 times 3, cube root of 27 is 3, cube root of 27 is 3 again. Negative 1 times negative 3 is a positive 3. 2 times 3 is 6. 3 times 3 is 9. All right, now at this point, you can only combine the ones that have the same radicands. So this guy and that guy. So 3 plus 9 is 12, so I've got 12 cube root of 3, and then I can't add it any further, 6 cube root of 6. And that's your final answer. Alright, moving on over to question 23. Okay, a binomial times a binomial, because it's two terms with a plus or a minus sign. Let's just go ahead and FOIL. Anytime you have a square root times itself, it's the radicand back, because think about that. Radical 3 times radical 3 is radical 9, which is just 3. So that's 3 minus, now negative 5 times 1 is negative 5. Now multiply under the radical. Radical 3 times radical 5x is radical 15x. Coefficients on this is just 1, so plus 1, but then 3 times 5x is 15x again. Minus, because it's a plus minus, 5. And then a radical 5x times a radical 5x 
is just 5x. Based on what I just said, anytime a square root is times itself, it's the radicand back. All right, so let's clean this up a little bit. I know that these are like terms. So in one fell swoop, I can rewrite this as negative 5 plus 1, which is a negative 4, radical 15x. Negative 5 times 5x is a negative 25x. Now take a step back and just look at what we wrote. I combine the radicals. I can't combine the 3 with the 25x because those are unlike terms. The 3 doesn't have an x on him. So that's actually as simplified as it's going to get. All right, where am I going next? Question 25. Oh, good, more cube root stuff. So again, your perfect cubes are anything of the form 1 cubed, 2 cubed, 3 cubed, 4 cubed, and so on. So 1, 8, uh, 27, 64. Those are all examples of perfect cubes. So when I'm breaking up the 32, don't be tempted by perfect squares and think 16. You got to think biggest perfect cube from that list that I just gave. Now I know 8 is a factor of 32, and 8 times 4 would give me 32. Now I'm going to put exponents in the first radical that are divisible by 3 because oops, the index of this is 3. 6 is divisible by 3, 3 is divisible by 3. But keep in mind that I had 7 y's, so I still have a leftover 1. So just take a moment, see how that makes sense. 8 times 4 is 32, x to the thirds all went in the first radical, and then I split up this y to the seventh so that everything was divisible by 3 in this first radical. Now I've got the 3 halves. Take the cube root by dividing by 3 on those exponents. That's x to the first y squared. Now, you just have to clean up the coefficients here. 3 halves times 2 is the same thing as 6 divided by 2, which is 3. Or, some of you may remember from middle school, cross-canceling, 3 over 1 is just 3. So no matter what, your final answer ends up being 3xy squared. And then some students will write this on their test and they're incorrect. As soon as you forget to write that little index of 3, your answer is wrong. So make sure on your test you don't forget to do the cube root symbol because that would be the biggest mistake students make. All right, so let's talk about rationalizing. At question 27, I have a radical 8 in the bottom. And notice how it's 2 times radical 8. So this is a monomial in the bottom. It's a single term. In order to clean this up a little bit, I would multiply the top and bottom by something that would make the radical 8 be a perfect square. Some of you may multiply by radical 8, but I'm actually going to multiply by radical 2 in the top and the bottom. And keep in mind that that radical 2 has to distribute to everything in that numerator. Focusing on the denominator real quick, this would be 2 times radical 16. And that's on purpose because I know 16 is a perfect square of 4, and that would help me get rid of the radical. In the numerator, I have radical 3 times radical 2, which is radical 6, plus 3 times 1 is 3, Radical 5 times radical 2 is radical 10. Clean this up a little bit. And again, we said this is 2 times 4, which is 8. And that's actually your final simplified answer. I cannot reduce that any further. I can't combine those radicals in the top because these are not like terms. Radical 6 and radical 10 are different. So you're done. Now, you could have multiplied by radical 8, then your denominator would have been 2 times 8, which is just 16. Ultimately, everything would have just been a little bit bigger, and you'd have some simplifying to do in the end. But by me multiplying by radical 2, it just saved me a little bit of work. So that's a monomial denominator, where it's a single term in the bottom. If you flip to the next page and look at question 30, this is a binomial denominator because there's either a plus or a minus in the bottom. In this case, it's a minus. So whenever you have a binomial denominator, you need to multiply by the conjugate. 
if you don't multiply by the conjugate in this, we're going to know that you just weren't paying attention at all because this is like super important. This is like the new, one of the new things for Algebra 2 that we talk about. A lot of students will think we'll just multiply by radical 7, but then you'd still have a 2 radical 7 here minus 7, and that does not help you. So if there's a 2 minus radical 7 in the bottom, I'm going to do 2 plus radical 7 because that's the conjugate. And whatever you multiply the bottom by, you have to also multiply the top by. Now, we talked about in class how with conjugates, when you completely FOIL out, the outer and inner terms will always drop out. Don't believe me? Take a look. This would get you negative 2 radical 7. This would get you positive 2 radical 7, which is 0. So I can do a shortcut and do just first with first, which would be a 4 minus last times last, which would give me a radical 49 or 7. In the numerator, I'm going to completely FOIL. Okay, so this is 2 plus radical 7 plus 2 radical 7 plus 7. Now, clean up the numerator and denominator separately. Some of you start seeing sevens and crossing stuff off, and that's, we're not at all there, okay? Look at the numerator. You have 2 plus 7, which is 9, and you have 3 total radical 7s. In the bottom, you have 4 minus 7, which is a negative 3. Now look at what we just wrote, okay? Does negative 9, or does 9 divide with negative 3? Does 3 divide with negative 3? Yes, it does. 9 divided by negative 3 is a negative 3. 3 divided by negative 3 is a negative 1. And that, or, if you want to write it like that, is your final answer. Negative 3 minus negative radical 7. Now, I'm not going to do it, but if you were to do question 29, you would multiply top and bottom by 2 minus radical 2. And I already know your denominator would be 4 minus 2. And that's what gets rid of your radicals. So I'll leave that for you to finish, but that's what the beginning of 29 would look like. On the last day of the unit, we talked about polynomial identities, where we prove that one side of the equation equals the other. You want to work on the equation that actually, or the side of the equation that actually has something to do. Like there's nothing to do on the right-hand side here. This actually has some multiplication. So what I'm going to first do is actually write out in expanded form what x plus y squared means. When in doubt, write it out. Same thing with x minus y squared. Let's FOIL. Okay, so that is from multiplying these two together. And then I'm going to leave the minus 3 here for a second. Let's multiply these two binomials. So x squared minus xy minus xy plus y squared. And notice how I always put stuff in alphabetical order. If you don't, it tends to make things more confusing for you, especially recognizing like terms. All right, now I am going to recognize like terms in each of those sets of parentheses just to make my life a little bit easier before I move on to the next step. So this would be x squared plus 2xy plus y squared minus 3 times x squared minus 2xy plus y squared. Now, you'll notice I dropped the parentheses here at this next line because technically the, nothing is going to change those, but I didn't drop the parentheses here because now what I'm going to do is distribute the negative 3 to everything. Because remember, we need to make this look like the right-hand side of the equation. So x squared plus 2xy plus y squared minus 3x squared plus 6xy minus 3y squared. I'm going to zoom out for a second. All right, we're looking pretty good. Now I have to combine like terms. So I have an x squared, an x squared, 
I see x y's to combine, and I see y squareds to combine. So looking at the right hand side of the equation, that helps me get an idea of how I want to rewrite this. So starting with my x squareds, x squared minus 3x squared is a negative 2x squared, so that checks out. 2xy plus 6xy is an 8xy. And y squared minus 3y squared is a minus 2y squared. Everything checked out the way that we wanted it to, and we're done. So I'm working one side of the equation to make it look like the other side using my polynomial operations. Because this is a proof, you need to show all your work and you need to be really clear. If you start doing work all over the place in like random locations and nothing's really flowing, you're not going to get full credit. Look at how nice and neat I am and how every line I'm doing something very obviously and deliberately so that you can see how I get from point A to point B. All right, so that's polynomial proving from our last day of notes. Earlier in the unit, we talked about when we would do synthetic division versus long division. So for something like E, when the division or the divisor is a linear coefficient or a linear function with a leading coefficient of 1, so x minus 2 or x plus 5, linear expression, leading coefficient of 1, this is when you do synthetic division. As soon as I put a 3 in front of it or like an x squared, this is where we do long division. So let's start with the synthetic because it's faster. Okay, something to always look for um, on your division problems is missing terms. So what I mean by that is in the numerator, I have an x cubed, so 3, 2, 1, 0, so I was missing an x squared, and then the bottom, your divisor is totally fine. Peel off the coefficients. And then I like to put my number in the upper right. When you take your divisor and set it equal to 0 to solve, you would get x equals 2. And that's what goes in the upper right. If you see any other answer keys on like delta math or even some other ones we have scanned in from prior teachers, they might put the 2 over here. But no matter what, it's going to be the same process. Okay, I like mine on the right. You bring down the first number. 4 times 2 is 8. Add. 0 plus 8 is 8. Multiply. Add. Multiply. Oops. 4 be 2. Add. Done. Okay, so this is the synthetic process that helps you get the coefficients on your answer. Now you are taking a third degree polynomial and dividing it by a first degree polynomial. Using exponent rules, wouldn't it make sense that you'd end up with a second degree polynomial? So this is going to be four, start with the x squared, and then descend exponent powers from there. x to the first, and then technically x to the zero. This last number is your remainder, and we always state our remainder as plus whatever the remainder is over the divisor. And that's your final answer using synthetic. Honestly, you guys were pretty good with synthetic, which is awesome. Now long division, if I go back over here, is a little bit more tedious. And you just have to be careful with your signs. All right, let me look for missing terms. Three, two, one, nothing, good. There's your divisor. Let's set up the house. Now you always look at the first two terms. And I like to ask myself in my head, 3x times what gives me 3x cubed? And hopefully you're able to answer yourself and say x squared. So that's what's going to go at the very top. Take that x squared and distribute him to each part of that divisor. So that's 3x cubed. And that's 2x squared. Now you're technically subtracting, but it's easier to add, right? 
So when we draw the line, I actually want you to change the signs. So this was a positive 3x cubed. Let's make it negative. And then same thing here. Circle the signs as you change them so you don't forget that you change them. And like I said, now you're going to add because you're adding the opposites. These drop out. That's the whole point. And we end up with 3x squared. And then you bring down the next term. Process starts over. 3x times what? gives us 3x squared. Hopefully you're able to answer yourself and say x. Yet again, you're going to distribute that x to each part of that binomial. x times 3x is 3x squared. x times 2 is a 2x. I draw the line. I change the signs. Those drop out. That's the whole point. And we have 6x plus 7. Process starts over. 3x times what gives you 6x, and hopefully you would know 2. Okay? 2 times 3x is a 6x. 2 times 2 is a 4. Draw the line, change the signs. 6x is drop out, and we end up with a positive 3. Now, if you try to start over, 3x times what gives you 3, that doesn't quite make sense. So this 3 is your remainder. Now, we state our remainder appropriately by doing plus whatever the remainder is over the divisor, and that's your final answer. All right, so that's one of each type of division, and I think I only had one, actually, I got one more page and a little bit more to go. All right, I know this video is getting long, so if you're still with me, great. If you're skipping around, that's great too. All right, next page, factor and remainder theorem. Um, for something like B where it says using the factor and remainder theorem, not division, explain if the given polynomial is a factor, okay? If you're dividing by x plus 6, what is the root of that or the solution? That would be negative 6, right? So what this means is you're going to take the original function and you're going to plug in negative 6, the root of the thing you're dividing by, and evaluate it. So let me go to my calculator. Okay, I'm actually going to go and store negative 6 as x. And then type in x to the fifth. 6x to the 4th squared. And hit enter. All right, so by doing that evaluating, I have found that the answer is negative 5. Based on factor and remainder theorem, that negative 5 is representing your remainder. Now, if we want to know if something's a factor or not, wouldn't we want a remainder of zero to be a factor? So, because I got a remainder of negative five, x plus six is not a factor of our given polynomial. All right, looking at question 34, find the value of k so that if you take this function and divide it by x minus 2, you get a remainder of 44. Again, factor and remainder theorem. This is just something that students always tend to forget, and that's why I'm really emphasizing it in this video. The root of the thing you're dividing by is 2, right? So this is saying, if this is your function f of x, I'm going to evaluate him at 2 and set him equal to the remainder of 44. So everywhere you see an x, I'm going to plug in a 2. And now clean this up a little bit. 2 cubed is 8. Okay, 8 minus k, or 8k minus k is 7k. Subtract the 2 would be 42. Four 
42 divided by 7 is 6, and that's your missing value of k. I'm going to put a star next to this. Again, this is your day 7 notes. All right, almost done. I think I only have one more problem I picked to do. Yep, question 37. So this is based off of a regions question we saw a few years back. Algebraically determine the value of h to correctly complete the identity stated below. So because this is an identity, they're telling you that the left-hand side equals the right-hand side, but we've deliberately omitted some information. Since I know the left-hand side equals the right, let's manipulate how this looks so it kind of looks similar to what you're seeing on the left. So what I mean by that is I'm actually going to distribute that 3x through and get 3x cubed plus uh, 3 hx squared plus 6x and then I'm going to do the same thing with the negative 1. Now let's rearrange this so that I have everything with its like term. So I mean, let's get the x squareds next to each other. Let's get the x's next to each other. Okay, now looking at your equation here, there's actually two ways you could solve for h. I'm going to pick here. These are your x's, right? When you look at the other side of the equation, they're telling you you should have three x's. So 3x equals 6x minus hx. Now everything's in terms of x, so let's ignore the x rule for a second. In order to solve for h, wouldn't you just subtract the 6? and divide by negative 1. So h should equal 3. Now, just for sake of, let's say you didn't do it in terms of the x's and you saw something different. What if we did it in terms of the x squareds? According to the identity, I should have 8x squareds. So if you set up a little equation of 3hx squared minus x squared equals 8x squared, okay, the x squared is almost like a unit of measure. Ignore that for a moment. You have 3h minus 1, because that's the coefficient on your x squared, equals 8. Add over the 1 and divide by 3. You'll notice that I got the same exact answer as what I did in blue. So no matter what, I determined that h equals 3. So technically you'd only have to show one solution, but I decided to show both. So what this is ultimately saying is, the left-hand side of this, 3x cubed plus 8x squared plus 3x minus 2 is equivalent to 3x minus 1 times x squared plus 3x plus 2, where I just substituted this 3 in for what h is. And if you wanted to and you really had time, you could actually double check this to see if it works by actually multiplying out the right-hand side of that and seeing if it equals the left. And that's actually what the work would look like. And it does in fact check. I do get 3x cubed plus 8x squared plus 3x minus 2. Not saying you have to do that, just kind of a nice little option there. And that concludes our Unit 1 video. So if you're looking for solutions to other problems, make sure you check out Google Classroom or whatever web website your teacher uses. Don't forget there's extra practice on Delta Math as well. But start with the review sheet, that's your base for what we write our tests on, and then go to Delta Math for extra practice. Good luck studying!